Siri, is the Earth a ball? A ball? Heavens no. How could you live on a ball? That doesn't seem possible. The Earth is clearly flat. So mainstream science tells us that the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, after a big bang that created the known universe. This wild theory is widely accepted as fact, and it's mechanically repeated by most people due to the fact that it's what public schools teach to the kids without challenge. There is absolutely no possible way to determine whether or not an event took place that long ago. It's actually very strange that anyone would believe this nonsense. Mainstream science also tells us that life on Earth evolved into monkeys, which eventually evolved into us. There's only one huge gaping problem with the theory of evolution. We are not only missing one link between monkeys and humans, but we are missing hundreds, if not thousands, of evolutionary links. Maybe more. They want us to believe that one day, we fell out of a monkey's ass, and we landed on a spinning ball that's advancing through outer space at ridiculous speeds. We are being deceived. Let's put it in perspective. They think they came from monkeys, okay? I don't care how many letters they have after their name. You know, these guys go to school, they read books, they come out believing they came from monkeys, and then they have the audacity to say that we're the stupid ones. Listen to what they have to say. In the beginning, there was darkness, and then, bang, giving birth to an endless expanding existence of time, space, and matter. Every day, new discoveries are unlocking the mysterious, the mind-blowing, the deadly secrets of a place we call the universe. It is, of course, a mystery as to why the universe exists in such an intelligible manner. But it suggests to me, at least, that there's a deep link between the universe, the grand scheme that's unfolding, and beings like ourselves. Somehow, the universe has become self-aware. It's engineered the emergence of comprehending, thinking beings like ourselves who can come to know the universe. Some people marvel at the fact that the universe has, over billions of years, given birth to beings who can appreciate its complexity. We can even ponder where and how we fit in. But at the dawn of history, people thought they knew the answers to these profound questions. The ancients viewed their world as a snow globe. It was essentially a flat earth, say a disc, covered by a dome. Uh, and we call this in English a firmament. And in the firmament is where all the stars and the planets were hung. Almost all ancient cultures believed their universe existed in a dome similar to this one. And they never questioned who created it. The ancients assumed that there was a god or gods responsible for the creation and the maintenance of the universe. The idea that God created the universe went largely unchallenged until the Middle Ages, when scientists made a sacrilegious suggestion based on their observations. The sun, not the Earth, was at the center of the universe. It was a paradigm shift. There is now another way to explain the naturally occurring phenomena around us, and this is science. Since the Middle Ages, scientists have developed sophisticated new theories about the enormity of the universe and our place in it. Theories that often have no room for God. Many phenomena have appeared mysterious or miraculous or magical. And then through the process of science, we've eventually understood them. Scientists gradually realize that the sun really is just one star among a multitude of stars in a gigantic galaxy, having hundreds of billions of such stars. And all this was created in a big bang 13.7 billion years ago. But while scientific theories, observations, and experiments tell us where we are in the cosmos, they don't answer the eternal questions. Why we're here, and who, if anyone, created us? 
So while it appears a divine creator planned the universe, many physicists say apparent fine-tuning doesn't prove anything of the sort. Something else must be at work. But what other than God could possibly explain the remarkable series of events that led to the creation of life in our universe? One very popular contender is an idea that seems at least as incredible as the idea of God. It's the multiple universe theory. A very large number of universes, perhaps even an infinite number, could in principle exist in a vast hyperspace. We can understand the idea of hyperspace by comparing it to a mug of beer. The beer mug would be the hyperspace and the bubbles would be these individual universes. The bubbles in a beer mug are all physically about the same. But suppose they span a range of properties. Some of them might have carbon and oxygen and stars and gravity and others don't. We would be in one of the ones that leads to a rich, complex universe culminating with life as we know it. If there are an infinite number of other universes, the fine-tuning that seems to be present in ours isn't an example of God's plan, but rather the law of statistics. Most of these universes wouldn't naturally develop in ways that fostered intelligent life but a few would. So then the explanation for the specialness of the universe is that we are winners in a gigantic cosmic lottery. It stands to reason that we couldn't be living and discussing this in a universe that was hostile to life. Only the bio-friendly ones get populated with thinking beings. Having a multitude of universes is actually quite a simple and natural consequence of some of the most favored models for the birth and early evolution of our universe. It's kind of like stars and planets. As long as you have the capacity to make one, it's easy to make lots of them. Oh, really? <laughs> evolution isn't the only thing we are being lied to about. The Earth under our feet has been molded into a spinning ball that is a byproduct of the Big Bang, which is a theory that was introduced to science in 1931. In order for the theory of evolution to be reasonable, the Big Bang that was somehow pinpointed to 13.7 billion years ago has to be true. In the Big Bang cosmology, the Earth is a rotating sphere orbiting around the Sun. The issue is that the motion of the Earth has never been detected, and here we are in the year 2016 looking for the curvature of our world which also can't seem to be measured. Mainstream science using theory after problematic theory to try and prove another theory isn't science at all. Real science will reveal a stationary Earth that's turning out to be quite flat, with a sun that's much closer than we are told. Despite what you hear, flat earthers aren't anti-science at all. We just don't condone what mainstream science has become and that's a faith-based religion swarming with lies and ludicrous theories that have never been proven. Also, this re-emergence of the Flat Earth has little to do with the Flat Earth Society. If you have the desire to further look into this, don't check for answers on their website. Some of the claims made by the Flat Earth Society are decent, while others are absurd. This is a common ploy to encourage no further investigation by the controlled opposition known as the Flat Earth Society. It's a commonly held misconception that the Earth is a spherical object that revolves around the Sun. But the fact is, of course, that the Earth is a circular dish surrounded by a barrier of ice that explorers have been attempting to penetrate for centuries. What if gravity isn't real? What if the Earth is, in fact, flat and science has been wrong all along. Everything that you've been taught is a lie. We're shown that and told that's the solar system, that's the way it works. You've got the big sun in the middle and all the planets revolve around it, but nobody's ever seen that. We've never seen a photograph of it. <clears throat> We've never seen, uh, you know, real part. We've certainly never seen any, any animation of it, even though there's supposed to be a probe out in Pluto at the moment. Um, nobody's ever seen the solar system like this. It's always graphics, it's always secondary knowledge. Things that people hold dear and call fact, like gravity, 
like the age of the universe, the uh, universe formation itself, the age of the earth, they're all dependent on things that are unproven. While they're good to consider, we should consider everything, you have allowed them to become facts that appear in our textbooks taught by professors to kids as facts. The argument, for all practical purposes, came to an end when the Church of England was established by law during the 16th century. They embraced many radical scientific notions prevalent at the time, including Copernicus' round earth theory. With this endorsement, the theory found its way into the schools, which were then largely controlled by the church. It has remained there to this day, and many children have accepted it without question. All C and I, and the square compasses. Here we have Buzz Aldrin, the second man, supposedly that walked on the grey dust of Kubrick's film set. Show it off, they don't try and hide it, it's a mason. There's his Mason Masonic ring, he's got his Shriner hat there. And these guys, yeah, they're supposedly praying to the command module. Looks like a pyramid to me. The connection between Ron L. Hubbard, or L. Ron Hubbard, who started the Scientology movement, Walt Disney, Bernard von Braun, rocket scientist, Jack Doug Parsons, also a rocket scientist, Jet Propulsion's laboratory, and Alistair Crowley, who's obviously you know an arch Satanist, uh, influenced a lot of you know rock music and and you know I mean, sort of the OTO, the Ordo Tempera Orientis. Um, these guys were all are all connected. They're all in the same brotherhood. Um, the connections between, well, here, here you go. Jack Parsons, uh, the JPL was how obviously NASA got into, you know, got, got into the air in the first place, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here's Jack Parsons at a Masonic ceremony, you can tell by the floor. And again, you can look into this for yourself. Yeah, There's, it's easily, it's not, it's not, you know, it's easily searchable, it's easily researchable information, the connection between Walt Disney. Here we have aboard the ISS. Again, now, now we're getting into the handshakes. Yeah, we've got Baphomet all doing it. Yeah, we've seen Bill Clinton do that and Bush and all, all these guys give you that. We know what that means. We know who they're in service to. This is all about occultism. It's all about sun worship, heliocentrism. It's not science. It's about, it's a religion, it's a faith. This is Helios. This is Helios the sun god. And here, you know, here he is on the badge of Apollo 13. This is all occult religion going all the way back to all Egypt and then back through to Babylon as well. Life is much simpler on a flat plane. There's no complex theories or complicated mathematics involved in it. The flat plane. No, there's uh, sea level is level everywhere you go at sea level is it's sea level there's no bending there's no bending the ocean around a spinning ball it's level it's all, water finds its level and it maintains there's you can't bend it around a ball this idea these facts they're facts resonating with people all over the world is not an accident it's not a coincidence that is the hardest part for you guys to understand the people that argue with me that want to make me feel like a fucking idiot that's not you talking that's your ego talking that's you have to convince yourself verbally to somebody who is challenging your own beliefs to make yourself feel better and to help you sleep at night the Flat Earth is a perfect example of that. You refuse to look at the information. It's stupid. Well, why is it stupid? Well, it just is. Well, you... Every little thing that you've brought up, all of you, can be refuted and explained differently, but you refuse to see that. You refuse to look at it. That makes you ignorant. That, that is the definition of ignorance. So how does Hollywood brainwash you? Well, one way is like this. They begin their movies on a globe and then they zoom in to whatever the first scene is. Real clever way to brainwash you in the very first scene of any movie you see. Universal Studios is so bad, they use this goddamn globe as their logo. 
as their intro to every single movie that they make. At the beginning of every single movie Universal makes, you're going to see the Spinning Globe logo. So it doesn't even matter what the movie's about. You're going to be brainwashed. No video. Real video of the real Earth spinning in space, which you could all like to see, actually exists. This is what he's shown. This is last year from the Discover satellite, the epic um, camera. This is actually the dark side of the moon. Going past the Earth. There's the Earth spinning. And there's the dark side of the moon. The only problem with that is the moon's supposed to be orbiting the Earth, not just flying straight past it. Your eyes aren't fooled, yeah? You've got your own senses, trust your senses. This is clearly CGI, but you go to NASA's website and they will claim this was taken from a million miles away from Earth by the Discover satellite. You will notice also that the clouds don't really move. I mean, they move across, but they don't change, don't swirl, they don't change direction. Um, five hours, 3.50 to 8.45 is nearly five hours of time-lapse photography, those Cloud, those those clouds do not move at all. You ever been mind fucked before? We don't have a picture of our Earth, except for the nice composite fake images NASA gives you to make sure you keep believing you're in a ball and keep arguing on their behalf, keep fighting for them, keep telling people we went to the moon simply because you can't let your mind think of the possibility that someone lied to you. The government lied to you. They can't lie. They're my government. Believe me, it's hard for all of us. That's crazy. The government doesn't lie to people. I was a huge Star Wars fan. Very, very disappointed to find out that I'm just being programmed. Again, it's a multi, multi-pronged multi approach to show you in, you know, they're not trying to pretend that Star Wars is real in any way, but again, it's impressing your brain again and again and again that the space and planets and, and spaceships and they're all round and everything else, okay? It's Hollywood. So now we've got the ISS. Does this look solid? Is this like a solid machine to you? But how do we know these are real? We don't. But i tell you what you don't see from the ISS, which you really should and you never do, is one of the 17,000 satellites that are also supposed to be spinning around up there as well. What difference does it make if it's a globe or if it's flat? They're stealing your money and showing you cartoons and CGI. Wouldn't that make a difference if it was a globe or if it was flat? Because they keep showing you cartoons of a globe. They show you CGI of a globe. They show you Hollywood trickery of a globe. They're stealing your fucking money. That's flat. That begs the question, hey, what the hell have you been showing us this ball for all this time? What have you been doing with our money? Did you guys go to space? Is evolution actually real? Did you guys just make this shit up? See, these are the questions we need to be asking. There might be more land out there to be discovered. There might be a fucking firmament up there. We don't know. They've stolen our mind from us and stuck us on a cartoon ball. We are being lied to, controlled, manipulated, stolen from. And I'm not going to stop speaking out. There is a quote by Tesla. Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments. And they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. That's what happened with the globe theory. Uh, everybody knew the world was flat until one day some guy came along and said, oh no, no, it's it's a ball. We're, we're spinning through space. We're circling the sun. A lie is a lie, even if everybody believes it. And truth is truth, even if no one believes it. Ptolemy refined a system with Earth at the center. For 1,500 years, Ptolemy's system was used as the basis of astronomy and calendars, and it worked quite well. Copernicus hated that, and Copernicus set about to undo Ptolemy's greatest discovery. While working at the request of Pope Leo X on improvements to the Julian calendar, 
Copernicus conceived what turned out to be the foundational idea of modernity itself, the idea that the Earth moved. Not all were persuaded by Copernicus, however. The greatest astronomer of the time, Tycho Brahe, developed a new geocentric model. The Earth occupies the center, the planets orbit the sun, and the sun orbits the Earth. They basically stole our minds and enslaved us by showing us a picture of a ball. Said, so here's what you live on, it's a ball. And then they show us a different picture of a ball. Here's a different picture of a ball. And everyone's just like, yeah, that's the same place. It doesn't matter if the colors of the continents change. It doesn't matter if the color of the oceans change. It doesn't matter if the continents change sizes, change locations. Tycho hired a young assistant named Johannes Kepler in 1600. Kepler, working on his own development of the Copernican system, needed Tycho's observations, but Tycho refused to part with them. When Tycho died suddenly and mysteriously in 1601, Kepler took charge of Tycho's observations and used them to develop his own system. In Kepler's system, the sun is in the center while the planets move on ellipses, non-uniformly. The ellipse with its two foci allows us to see that Ptolemy's epicycles and equant were actually a brilliant attempt to express non-uniform motion centuries before Kepler. Indeed, once the concept of non-uniform motion is introduced, all of these systems can be shown to be geometrically identical. Copernicus was the main guy who started off the revolution. His book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres changed, you know, thousands of years of thinking about the Earth being completely still, as you can experience it for yourself every single day of your life, and the, obviously the bodies move, move in the heavens above us. That's what your senses experience. Copernicus changed all that round, but he didn't use any science. There's no science in his book. He got his ideas from the Hermetica, from Hermes Trismegistus. And it basically says how the sun sits enthroned in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the solar system, and we all orbit around it. What's that sound like to you? That sounds like sun worship. It sounds like sun cult to me. Because later on, I'm going to show you. Hoyle, uh, Fred Hoyle was another astronomer. Well, he said there's no difference in, in the mathematics, whether it's geocentric or helio. So with that, the sun moves around the earth, the earth moves around the sun. The math works the same exactly the way. The connections between just just for, just from the imaging. Yeah, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be, um, you know, uh, have a portrait done with a big 33 on it or, or a triangle with an eye or anything like that. I wouldn't want to be connected or associated with any of that stuff because, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm working for the other side. Um, so, but Copernicus obviously had no problem with the square, with the square and compass, yeah? Um, with the big wheel here, we've got the big sun wheel and we've got the Mercury sign as well. Yeah, all leads back again. I'll, you know, you, you can you can um, investigate that more for yourself. The Book of Thoth by Alistair Crowley, Freemason with the sun over the head. Yeah, as above, so below. Yeah, um, one of the reasons why Mercury, because it can rise in the morning and the night, so it's also hermaphroditic. Uh, both sexes, which is obviously is Baphomet as well, which we know as the the, the breasts and the penis. It goes on and on and on. It's all about cult sun worship. You can trace it back to Babylon. You can see all the different gods going through it, but there is no science to Copernicus's um, on the revolutions of the spheres. Uh, it's, it's a philosophical trap, and it's all based on the Hermetica. Up is up, down is down. If I, a visual aid, I have a pin. If I release it from my grip, what happens? Anybody? Correct, it falls. Was that gravity? No. The molecules that make up this pen, the plastic, the ink, it's got a little rubber grip on it, are more dense than the molecules of the air surrounding it. The molecules of the air will not support the weight so they fall, so it falls when you let go. Like that. Density and mass make an object heavy. There's no there's no gravity. Simple. Up is up, down is down, 
objects fall because they're heavy. If it floats, it's lighter than air. Helium, fill a balloon with helium, it goes up. Filled it with hydrogen, it would also go up. Lighter than air, floats. Heavier than air, falls. It's not complicated. Gravity is a god because it's the answer. It's the magic answer to everything. Why, how does this, how does the, how does the earth keep us on, but it still spins around, it's still orbits, and all, gravity. How's the moon, how's the type of gravity? Why doesn't the moon fly off to the sun? Because the sun's got bigger gra gravity. It's the way gravity works, don't worry about it, it's gravity. Gravity is the god that explains everything very, very magically. There is no need for gravity whatsoever if we're on a fixed stationary plane and the, the heavenly bodies are, are simply going above us. The reason why you don't fall off is because you're denser than the air that under, underneath you. It's just, again, Occam's race. It's a straightforward explanation. Basically, the perspective of living on a globe is preposterous, it's ridiculous. It's hilarious how we are taught to perceive the world we live on because basically even when trying to <laughs> depict it it's hilarious they have no way of depicting it without it being comical you have whales climbing <laughs> the curve like it's absurd how could we live on a globe core of the earth you know that you've seen the cutaway this much is crust and mantle and magma and liquid molten stuff at the center um, the deepest hole that's ever been drilled in the history of mankind to date even with today's technology eight miles if you want to say this is what the first eight miles looks like, I will believe you because they can show me the hole. This goes eight miles down, okay? It goes eight miles down. That's how thick is the plane that we live on? It's at least eight miles because <laughs> they've drilled down that far, but they can't go any farther. It just, it doesn't work. So it's speculation with a sphere of 4,000 miles radius being a, a spun round once every 24 hours a little bit of calculations will show that that person there is being spun round at about a thousand miles an hour and it doesn't know it I mean this is obvious nonsense the stage was set for one of the most important events in the history of physics the Michelson Morley experiment the experiment failed to detect the Earth moving in or against the ether. The problem was serious. Although various solutions were advanced, in the end, science was faced with a choice. Either discard the ether or admit that the Earth wasn't orbiting the sun. It was Albert Einstein who came up with the solution, which now forms the basis of our physics and which we call the theory of relativity. Einstein eliminated the ether as the cause and said that it was simply a principle of nature. That when objects move through empty space, they contract in length, they decrease in the time traveled, and their mass increases, all by the same proportion. Hence, in order to maintain the Copernican principle, the length, time, and mass of moving objects were altered. This is the essence of Einstein's special theory of relativity. All of physics collapses with that experiment. Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate and sometimes they rotate far too much. Scientists who have repeated variations of the experiment have conceded time and again that Quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. The behavior of the pendulum actually depends on, one, the initial force beginning its swing, and two, the ball and socket joint used which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum's swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. 
if Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360 degree uniform rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. It has been said that the pendulum experiment proves the rotation of the Earth, but this is quite impossible, for one pendulum turns one way, and sometimes another pendulum turns in the opposite direction. Now we ask, does the Earth rotate in opposite directions at different places at one and the same time? We should like to know. Perhaps the experimenters will kindly enlighten us on this point. There's all kinds of evidence for the phenomenon of what's called continental drift. This means that the, the continents are able to move as if they're floating on a fluid. Now, if the Earth is, is spherical, if it's spinning, can any, anybody knows that if this is spinning very, very, very fast like that, that the continents should all be located at the equator. Because centrifugal force would move the continents from the poles to the middle. The Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's pendulums spinning either which way, sinks and toilets in the northern and southern hemisphere do not constantly spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin in opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the Earth. Jennifer Horton wrote, while the premise makes sense that the Earth's eastward spin would cause the water in a toilet bowl to spin as well, in reality, the force and speed at which the water enters and leaves the receptacle is much too great to be influenced by something as minuscule as a single 360-degree turn over the span of a day. When all is said and done, the Coriolis effect plays no larger a role in toilet flushes than it does in the revolution of CDs in your stereo. The things that really determine the direction in which water leaves your toilet or sink are the shape of the bowl and the angle at which the liquid initially enters the bowl. The Coriolis effect is also said to affect bullet trajectories and weather patterns as well, supposedly causing most storms in the northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise and most storms in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise, to cause bullets from long-range guns to tend towards the right of the target in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Again, however, the same problems remain. Not every bullet and not every storm consistently displays the behavior and therefore cannot reasonably be used as proof of anything. They got us to ridicule it, and that was the genius in their whole plan. If you ridicule something socially, it's, it's ridiculous, so I'm not going to look into it. When if you think about it, up, if you flip it inside out, to assume the Earth is flat is so makes so much sense. To assume it's a globe is so ridiculous. We should have laughed at that, you know. And it's funny how people who still believe in the sphere always make fun of the flat Earth because they'll say, "Well, how should I? How can I stay on? I'll fall off. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. I'll fall off." Yet they have total faith in not rolling, tumbling down the sphere. For some reason, this appears safe to them. You know, it's like, no, wouldn't a level surface appear more sensible and safe if you really think about it? People say, well, go look at the planets. The planets are, are spheres, so that means we're a sphere. No, without a telescope. I've got one. Whip out your telescope and look at Mars. It's a dot of light. It's an orange dot. And then when you look at a NASA image, it's this desert world with canyons and ice and craters and shit. But when you look at it through an amateur telescope, like a good amateur telescope, not one from fucking Walmart, like a good one, it's an orange dot. It's not a desert world with canyons and shit that they went to. There's no rover on Mars. <laughs> They're prepping us with movies like The Martian so they can steal our money on a fake trip to Mars. Just like they stole our money on a fake trip to the moon.
You don't need all the complex theories and math. The sun isn't 93 million miles away. It's much closer, much closer, and much smaller. Oh, it's 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's also 400 times farther away, so it appears to be the same size. The sun and moon are the same size, and they're not as far as they say they are. They circle above the plane that we live on, the flat plane, they circle. The sun shines down like a spotlight around 24 hours. The same phenomenon Eratosthenes measured could be explained by a flat Earth if the sun were only a few thousand miles away and 32 miles across. The math would work out the same. Once you know, once you realize what's going on, you're on a flat plane, you can see the sun. It's like it moves towards you, passes overhead, it moves away from you. It's perspective, the distance, it moves that direction until it reaches the vanishing point, the point of convergence on the horizon where you can no longer see its light. And um, this is a really, really good video to watch. It's called The Ama Amazing Flight of a Balloon to the Edge of Space. And if you watch it, you will see, because those are clouds there. This isn't, this isn't the ocean, this is clouds. And what have we got here? That's a hot spot from the sun. Now, if the sun's 93 million miles away, yeah, but, but massive, how is it causing a heat spot on here? Well, so this is a skill for me, you can watch the video for yourself, but this is what it does, there's minutes and minutes of this video as it spins around and you can see it again and again. It will blow your mind because you'll see the sun isn't that far away at all, because it can't be causing a heat spot on the clouds if it's 93 million miles away. If it's massive, it should all be coming in at the same angle, there should be no... The sun is obviously not 93 million miles away. It looks very close. Circumnavigation is really just a flat circle path. Gravity as we know it simply doesn't exist. The sailor thinks that he's traveling around the Earth this way, when in effect he's traveling around the Earth this way. And he's creating a circle. He's, he's moving in a continuous direction around. He goes through the various parts of the circle, and he comes back where he started from, he swung around this way. One of heliocentrists' favorite supposed proofs of their ball earth theory is the ability for ships and planes to circumnavigate, to sail or fly at right angles to the North Pole, and eventually return to their original location. Since the North Pole and Antarctica are covered in ice and guarded no-fly zones, however, no ships or planes have ever been known to circumnavigate the Earth in north-south directions, only east-west. And herein lies the rub. East or westbound circumnavigation can just as easily be performed on a flat plane as it can on a globular sphere. Just as a compass can place its center point on a flat piece of paper and trace a circle either way around the pole, so can a ship or plane circumnavigate a flat Earth. The only kind of circumnavigation which could not happen on a flat Earth is north-south bound, which is likely the very reason for the heavily enforced flight restrictions. Flight restrictions originating from none other than the United Nations, the same United Nations which haughtily uses the flat Earth map as its official logo and flag. So the ball earther's logical argument is that only a globe can be circumnavigated, the Earth has been circumnavigated, and therefore the Earth is a globe. This is indeed a logical modus ponens statement, but the conclusion is rendered invalid because the first premise, that only a globe can be circumnavigated, is categorically false. There is no curve, man. You went up on top of your house and saw the curvature, you went on a plane and saw the cur- No, you didn't. There is no curvature. You know how I know? I tried to debunk the flat earth and I failed. That's how most of us get started. We try to debunk the flat earth and we fail. There's no evidence <clears throat> for curvature when you use your own senses and your own observations. Cross Lake Michigan from St. Joseph to Chicago is 60 miles. Over 60 miles to anything under 2,400 feet should not be seen. This is a visual of how that works. See the blue, obviously the green line is you're straight out. 
because if you were looking straight out, obviously the view is supposed to curve, so the blue line is where it curves. Anything beyond the blue line should not be seen. Sears Tower is only 450 feet high, it's the highest obviously building in Chicago. It's giving you the heights of some of the rest of the um, buildings there. There's quite a famous picture, uh, a guy called Joshua Nowicki. Of Chicago from 60 miles away, we shouldn't be able to see any of it. It should be all behind 2,400 feet of curve. Yeah. Now people say, ah, but you can't see the bottom of the, you know, it's proven that the Earth's curved because you can't see the bottom of it. But you can't see the bottom of it because seas and lakes, they wave. They go up and down, they're not completely, I mean, obviously if it's completely flat and completely clear, then you, you'll, you'll see a lot more of it. But this actually proves that the, that, the, that the picture wasn't taken from very high above sea level. If it was, you, you, you'd see a lot more of the buildings, like in this next one. From slightly closer, from only 37 miles away, and which will be behind 900 feet of curve, I think we can see more than 500 feet of the Sears Tower there, but you can see virtually all of the skyline. Because obviously it's a clearer day, it's a little bit brighter, and obviously the, the waves aren't as choppy. Here's the opposite, there's the, you know, there's 36 miles of waves in between. Why would we see the whole thing? But we can still see far more of it, it should be 840 feet of drop. You shouldn't be able to see, oh, you should be able to see less than, less than the top half of those. We move on to a different city, Toronto, across Lake Ontario, a place called Grimsby, obviously not in Lincolnshire. 37 miles away, so be behind 900 feet of curve. The CN Tower is 1,800 feet tall. You should be able to see only the top half of that and hardly any of the rest of Toronto. Can we see pretty much the whole skyline there? Again, you can check this out for yourself. I, I, I had a, I, you know, you can get half a dozen of these pictures from various places all around this bay. Yeah, this is actually taken from the red lines there. It's actually, the crimson of his here. So it's actually a little bit further than this red line, but you can get pictures of, from Toronto from all over this beach. Yeah, and you can see way more of it than we should be. Now people say, oh, well, that's light refracting, bending it round the curve. <laughs> it doesn't look like a mirage. I've seen mirages, they're inverted or they're wavy. We know what a mirage looks like. That's just, that's, we can see it in the distance. 81 miles away from Genoa. It's the Isle of Gorgona. It's only 70 feet above sea level. We shouldn't be able to see any of We should be able to see the tip of it. We can see most of the island. It should be behind 4,300 feet of curve. It should have curved away by now. We can still see it. We'll bring it closer back home. The Isle of Man from the file Co, 61 miles away. And again, we can't just see the tops of the turbines, we can see virtually all of them. From 61 miles away, Snaefell is 2,030 feet high, 2,034 feet high, so that's the highest point on the Isle of Man. 61 miles away should be 2,480 feet of curvature. Should be, you know, half a mile below the horizon. From London, 75 miles away. Starts getting interesting when you go when you start getting towards the 100 mile mark. We're talking over a mile of dip now. This is the uh, Isle, Isle of Oahu, taken from Kaui, Kaua, Kaua, thank you, in Hawaii. It's 90 miles away. Again, you can see, you know, apart from, you know, whatever bit the waves are hiding, we can see a lot of that island. And here's, here's the numbers for it. It should be behind 5,400 feet of drop. Its elevation is 4,003 feet, so we shouldn't even be able to see the tip of it. You can see nearly all of it. This is the Sierra Nevada range from Mount Diablo in California, San Francisco. It's 160 miles away. Yes, we're up a mountain, yes, they're up a mountain, but we can see, again, a lot of the bottom of the mountains. You can, you can see the snow-capped tops, and then we can see the rest of the mountains as well. 160 miles away, this should be, should be behind 17,000 feet of curve. Again, yes, you might be able to see the top of it, but not all of the mountains. And here's the furthest one I've found so far. This is my record so far. If it's, I'm sure it'll keep on growing. This is the reunion island from the Isle of Mauritius. It's 149 miles away. It's a long, long, long way away. And once again, we can see the peak, but we can also see most of the rest of the This is quite clearly a very, very good observational day. Very clear, very calm. Um, the highest peak on Reunion Island is 3,072 metres tall, it's just under two miles. 149 miles away, everything should be behind 2.8 miles of curvature. Should have curved way, way away. And again, it's not just the tops we can see, we can see much more, we can see a lot more. You know, 2,000 feet or so of that. We can see far more. That's what I'm saying about the Z-axis curve. It's not there. It's not there. If you watch a boat out to sea and then get a telescope on it, it'll come back into view again. 
yeah? It's perspective and it's obviously the limits of our, our, our eyesight, but it's also conditions as well, quite clearly. Yeah, heat, haze, condition, what have you. Visible condition, do check. But the point is that photographs have been taken. I've just shown you a dozen photographs from starting at 30 miles, 60 miles, 90 miles. Now we can see, oh, we can see 150 miles in the distance and it should well have disappeared behind the curve of the globe. Huge flat places on Earth, everybody's aware. If you ever watch Top Gear, the Bonneville Salt Flats, where everybody goes racing. But there's even bigger ones in South America. Uh, is it uh, Ethiopia? Uh, they've got the Salad, Salad uh, uh, in, in Bolivia. They've gone for uh, 4,000 square miles. They've gone for hundreds of thousands of square miles. Big flat places on Earth. Yeah, famously, flatter than a pancake. <clears throat> the evidence is all around us. The Earth is flat, and that is that. Don't overthink this thing. It's not necessary. Primary knowledge or secondary knowledge? You're going to use your own senses, your own observances, your own experiments, hopefully, or you're going to believe what you've been told just because that's what everybody believes. It's not this overly covert, like, psyop. Like, what would be the point of that? To discredit the truth movement? If you look into Flat Earth for three hours, that you, you would realize that it's not a psyop. It's not a PSYOP. A PSYOP of that magnitude that would ultimately bring the truth movement to its... Do you really think the truth movement is going to be brought to its knees anytime soon, given all the information? The same is with Flat Earth. Think about it. So why? why, why what, what, what have they got to gain? You know, why bother? Well, as far as I'm concerned, if you've... Once you've done your research, and, and if you come to the same conclusion that uh, myself and thousands of others have done, it overthrows heliocentrism, it overthrows the Big Bang, it over overthrows evolution, overthrows everything we, we thought we knew about the world. And I've heard people say that uh, the reason they don't want to publish uh, papers that disagree with special relativity or general relativity is that they built their careers on this. If you were paranoid, you'd say there's a conspiracy, whatever it is. Uh, there is a lot of resistance to getting something published that disagrees with either of Einstein's two theories. As for all of the photos and video evidence we now have that the Earth is round, well, all of that material is completely fabricated. A hoax perpetrated by space agencies, airlines, globe manufacturers. They are reaping the rewards of our ignorant belief that the Earth is actually round.
stupid rumor I started laughing That's a fact I knew for certain That I would disprove it A true story.